Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Kat. As the title suggests, I got my NIW approved recently. So I would like to, you know, share my experience with you all and hopefully this can address some of your concerns if you want to apply the EB2 NIW as well. And if you like such content related to immigration and how, you know, as a foreigner living in the United States, please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel where I share tips about immigration, career development and personal growth from a PhD's perspective. Without further ado, let's get started. First, I think you should decide if you need a lawyer. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about pros and cons, you know, with uh, or without a lawyer. So with a lawyer, you can leverage their experience and legal team, of course, and some of them can provide the templates that you need for your application. And that can save you a lot of time and energy, especially, you know, you're working a full time job or you're still in school. Second, having the lawyer would increase the credibility when you apply it because the lawyer will sign the application. So the immigration officer are just more likely anecdotally to have a favorable decision. So of course, as we know, having a lawyer just means your costs just gets a lot higher, right? You can quickly Google around how much does it cost to have a lawyer represent you applied an IW application online. So of course, without a lawyer, that saves you a lot of money, right? Um, that just goes back to your pocket. You act as your own lawyer. Of course, that just also means you have to spend all this energy and time researching, first of all, how to fill all this application, what goes into a EB2 NIW application. And then you have to make sure, you know, you don't really make mistakes along the way because it's immigration. So one little step can mess up the whole package. So that could translate to, you know, maybe longer time to prepare your application. Um, and maybe just a little bit slightly professional because I do trust us PhDs or people with other advanced degrees can uh, write cover letter and applications as real world papers. If you decide to use a lawyer, I personally would strongly recommend that compare different lawyers, okay? Finding a good lawyer is so, so, so important. I just really have to stress that. A good lawyer can save you time, energy, and money, okay? You might be wondering why money, because actually each lawyer charged differently. But that doesn't mean the lower cost lawyer is not as good as or not, or maybe even better than the other one who charge a lot. On, on top of that, a good lawyer, maybe, you know, if they complete everything right, they've actually even excelled the application, they're so experienced with it, then you might get approved you know, on your first try without additional proof of evidence or even denial. And all that at extra time and of course cost because if you have to reapply, that's a lot of money. When you look for a lawyer, you want to make sure that lawyer charge a reasonable cost. Of course, you know, they are providing professional service. They need to charge your the service fee, but I've heard some lawyer charges outrageous amounts. Okay, it's like six times more than what I've paid to my lawyer. And second, I want you to pay attention and make sure this lawyer really, really focus on the NIW or like you want EB2 NIW, okay? Just very much focus on this area instead of this lawyer say, oh, I'm an immigration attorney. I do EB1, I do EB2, I also do family immigration, I also do business immigration, you know, they do everything. Then I would be a little bit cautious on that. Next, you want to look for the lawyer is who is reputable, okay? So you can ask for your friends, referrals, or read their Google online review, make sure they, they provide decent services, right? And lastly, I want to say, that was more like bonus point because many lawyers, they actually don't do that. But if this lawyer or their legal team um, does have more scientific backgrounds, that's really a plus uh, to people like us because that means they know potentially um, research in general, they can read your papers, they understand on the surface level what your research is about, so they can help you and more personalize your application and your cover letter. 
And of course, that can circle back to my initial point that just ask around and compare different lawyers, you know. Some law firm, they might be very large and very well known, um, but they might not actually be the best um, in the NIW or in your case specifically. So let me just give you an example. I consulted a, um, I would say relatively large a law firm who specialize in NIW, okay? They have many, many attorneys who specialize in NIW and EB1. And I kind of just, I had a free consultation with them. And then they pretty much told me point blank that I am not eligible for NIW. And my case just ended there with them. Um, but of course, I had, uh, I vetted this law firm already, you know, I have multiple uh, people that I know from my previous labs have applied and the WEB1 through this law firm. So it's not like they don't know what they're doing. It just maybe for my specific case, um, they think I'm a consultant. That's why I'm not qualified. Also, at least I think many lawyers, um, they don't really charge initial consultation fee when it comes to NIW or at least the Asian ones <laughs> that I've consulted um, last year. And um, they would, you know, very nicely have a first free consultation with you. So please just talk to at least two, three lawyers before making a decision who you should use. So after you decide you want to use a lawyer, you found a good lawyer, you sign a contract, you maybe pay the lawyer fee, and then the first step and the most time consuming step, at least from my experience, is to gather your reference. So for me, it took a few months uh, last year. And of course, it depends on you know how fast and just how early you get a response from your references. But the whole idea, if we take a step back, is to get about three to four references to prove your outstanding contribution to the field to the United States. And, you know, people, of course, find their references in all different ways. For example, if you've talked to uh, people who are in your field at different conferences, in grad school, postdoc, or if you've given a poster session or an oral presentation at different seminars, uh, there are people, right, who are very much interested in your work uh, or they even admire what you do. And then you maybe already have those connections then reaching out to those people relatively easy, right? Because you've talked to them and you might already, you know, had a few email exchanges as well. So you know each other a little bit. That means they know you or at least they remember you. So it's just easier to ask them for a reference than a complete stranger, right? Even in your field. In addition, they can add their personal touch on their reference letters to really showcase how significant your work is, how that benefits their work, which is really important for NIW cases. So for me, I probably did uh, the most common method. Um, I didn't really have those contacts, so I pretty much just Google scholars my own name, and then I went to my own publication. So I went my so I, I went to all of my publications. And no matter how old they are, because some of them date, you know, 10 years ago, almost, because, you know, I published them when I was uh, in college. Then I looked for who cited my papers. Um, and the reason I do that, because if they cited your paper, that means first, um, they know about your research, your area of expertise, and how significant your publication is. Then I created a list of authors who cited all my papers. And for me, it's not really a long initial list. So to me, it was short because I technically cannot use um, my country of citizenship, which is China and United States. So, you know, there are just a lot of Chinese researchers out there, um, me included, of course. But to me, you know, they are definitely not on my initial list. I mean, unless I'm really, really desperate, then I could reach out to them and just give it a try. So Chinese or American, authors who cited my paper kind of maybe accounts for 70% of all the authors that cited my paper. So, you know, as you can imagine, I have to just exclude them. That's why my initial list is pretty short. Second, it's better if your references are, you know, at professor level um, or just more senior level than postdocs or graduate students. Um, of course, more senior, the better, right? Um, but oh, again, as you can imagine, 
more senior they are, more likely they don't respond to your emails, right? Um, so I first sent you maybe five or six of uh, those professors. So at least they're faculties, they're not postdocs. But I want to actually say to my surprise, uh, throughout this process, I didn't realize how nice um, professors are. If you think about it, uh, if I were a prestig prestigious tenured professor, why would I even care a random email in my inbox asking for a reference letter, right? I am so busy doing my own research and admin stuff, you know, it's just a lot already going on. So it's, I really appreciate their response and help. Also, when I emailed them, it was last summer, um, around July. So that means summer holidays, right? And most of them are Europeans. Um, so you know how they take their vacations seriously. You know, I have very limited choices, uh, to be honest. So only one person replied maybe within a week and then the other three maybe replied after I sent another kind of follow-up email. Uh, it was very interesting because one professor kind of told me, oh, I'm going to be in the woods for the next two weeks um, to write a paper and I will get back to you as soon as I can, um, basically as soon as I'm back. But they're all super, super nice. And again, you know, one of them was awarded medals by the president of his country, you know, like it's that prestigious. And then he used to be, um, I think the chairman of National Academy of Science in his country. And, you know, like he was willing to be my reference. So I was really, really honored and then really appreciated his help. Also, um, I was really hyped because actually not only just got four, but I got five reference letters. Um, and in the end, I have to pick four out of the five. I just can't express my gratitude to these amazing, amazing researchers who contribute to not only science every day, but also is about to change my life and maybe other people's life who they helped by being my reference. And it took maybe about six weeks in total to complete all the letters for me, at least. So it was not really, really terrible considering the timing. But again, it was summertime. And then the lawyer and I both pretty much just prepared the application package together, mostly the lawyer and the legal team. Uh, to me, it's more just to think what I've achieved and uh, um, help write the cover letter. Again, the legal team was really, really helpful. They have the re research background, as I mentioned before, the bonus points. So it was really easy to communicate with them. And with their significant help, the cover letter was done very fast and very smoothly. And then, of course, the, the law firm took it from there. All I did was to get a letter to prove that I'm actually employed um, by my employer that I claimed. Oh, and pay the USCIS fee, which, you know, it's all just public information. Um, then, of course, you can choose um, when you file, you can choose if you want to do premium processing, which means you don't have to wait like everybody else. Your case will be processed within two weeks, I think like 14 business days. Uh, but that also means a very steep premium processing fee of 2500 And I think it has increased early this year to 2800 or so. So, of course, I did not use premium processing. Basically, I chose to wait. There's a website you can check actually USCIS case processing time. I'm, sh I'm just sharing this website here and you can just choose which form you want to check. And in my case, of course, is I-140 and which processing center. It will tell you how long it takes to process that specific form at that location. Uh, for me, I checked back then, it says probably like 80% of case processed in 10 months. So I applied um, late last September. So plus 10 months, it's it's going to be, you know, July this year. So I was like, okay, we'll just, you know, wait. Um, I didn't even bother checking my case. Then earlier this month, um, May 2024, I got a mail notification by USPS on my, you know, in my inbox, in my email inbox, which is something you can, you know, just sign up with USPS. So the USPS just scan your mail and email you what you might be expecting in the mail. And I saw there was a letter from USCIS. So I was like, oh my God, um, I'm not sure if it is a decision letter. So I was kind of, I, I was a little bit nervous, I would say, because there are three scenarios, right? So one is approval, one is denial. And lastly, you basically have to submit additional information to prove your case, RFE. Just like in you know, a revision for papers, that's how I typically talk about those. 
so I was really nervous about this. So uh, what happened was I did not check the mail myself. Um, I asked my partner to go out and check it for me. I was kind of watching him walk to the mailbox from the window and then watching them come back uh, with the mail. And you know, it was like, he, he has such a poker face. So I had no idea what was going on. And he opened the door and showed a piece of approval notice. So I was really, really happy about it. And of course, um, we celebrate that day as well. Speak of celebration, I do have more news for you guys. So stay tuned to my next announcement video. But this pretty much concludes my NIW application and timeline. Uh, of course, I am a Chinese citizen. So that just means the wait time uh, to get actual green card is a whole <laughs> another problem, which I'm not gonna elaborate here. Uh, I'm sure all my fellow Chinese and Indians understand my pain. Uh, but I'm still very glad that my NIW is approved so I can move on. If you have any questions, please comment below um, and I will try to address them. If you like such content, please thumb up and subscribe to my channel. This is Kat and I will see you in the next video.